Thank you all very much for coming to today's digital globalization event. We've got an arena format, which is going to be a special challenge, but my hope is that we will all really be able to talk as a group. That's the potential of having the arena. And so we're going to start here by having my ask each person, each of our guests, a question, and then I'm going to go out and around in the audience. So those of you who are sitting behind me, don't think I'm going to completely ignore you for the entire session. Uh, you will have chances as well to ask questions. But with that, I'm going to briefly turn my back to you. So just a moment. So today we have four guests. We have Richard Baldwin. He is the author, as you know, of The Globotics Upheaval, a popular new book looking at how the digital globalization is beginning to change lives all over the world, not just in affluent countries, but also in less affluent countries as well. We have Ian Waitman, who is from IHS Market. It's a remarkable source of uh, data uh, and uh, really the leader in uh, many broad areas of consulting. He's seeing how this is working out in terms of some of the numbers uh, of the the products and some of the changes in the economies. Simon Gulpin is here from Bahrain, uh, an example of an affluent country and how that is adapting to the gig economy. And then finally, um, we have Marisa Velis uh, Ruiz, who is here from Guatemala City. She is with Sheva, which is a sustainable development NGO that is now in the process of expanding out of Guatemala to seven other Latin American countries so as to provide mobile uh, services in those places as well. Richard, since uh, your book is part of the inspiration for this panel and really gives us an overall theme, why don't I start with you? In your book, you warn of an international talent tsunami that is going to sweep away uh, stable middle-class jobs across the industrialized world and affect them elsewhere as well. Should we be gloomy or what is the broader outlook? Well, so the, the basic idea is I think many people are talking about artificial intelligence and how it will disrupt the future of work. And they've forgotten that the same technologies will affect the same service sector jobs at the same pace. So in some sense, that's globotics. Globalization and robotics will affect the future of work. Now, basically, the service sector in the advanced countries has been a closed economy, no competition. Because it's been difficult to provide services when you sit in one country in another. But digital technology is changing that reality, and that will bring people in offices in rich countries in direct wage competition with workers from all around the world. And one aspect of digital technology, machine translation, will allow many people who are now excluded from the world service market to speak good enough English and therefore to participate in this telemigration, as I call it. So I am worried that it'll sweep it away, but ultimately I'm an economist, I believe in globalization. There'll be pains and gains. This is allowing people to focus on what they're good. So eventually it will be good. I think it's just important that we manage the transition correctly. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Why don't I turn to you, uh, Ian. One of the questions that I guess everybody asks is, is this in fact producing net gains? Uh, and Richard, I guess, is presenting the long-term optimistic scenario. But as you look at uh, different economies, uh, we don't seem to see right now a surge in unemployment broadly across many countries. We have U.S. unemployment under 4%. We have uh, uh, Chinese unemployment, as the Premier remarked here yesterday, still around 5% uh, based on the way they do their survey. Uh, that said, as you look at, at the data, is this causing more dislocation, or is it still in sort of a net creator of opportunities as we get this digital globalization? I think it's really a long journey, and we've got to look back and what's in the future. So if we look backwards, it's really been driven things by the internet initially, and mobilization of people, and the mobile phone, frankly. Um, and that caused net changes, it, it created e-commerce, and it created disruptive technologies, but not in a way that were destructive <coughs> to jobs. If we look into the future, that's where we start seeing things change more radically in certain ways. Um, so if you look at the digital transformation, this includes things like artificial intelligence, including the Internet of Things, lots of data. And that's where you really start having a, a, a big change in the way that economies will operate. So, for example, you will have uh, manufacturing sectors that will largely be replaced by robotics, by artificial intelligence. 
And you have some of the higher skilled jobs that maybe are now done by uh, data entry specialists in, in, in certain countries, and they could be automated. Again, machine learning, uh, digital scraping, uh, make, make some of those jobs become redundant. And so we have to evolve what we're doing as we do that very carefully to make sure that we don't disenfranchise some of those countries that have now got partway along the journey with us uh, and that we don't lose them along the way. So it's different. It's not going to be more of the past. It's going to transform into the future. Uh, thank you, Ian. Why don't I turn to a couple of country-specific examples then, and why don't we start um, uh, with Guatemala. When I think of mobile services in remote areas, I'm, I'm a foreign correspondent for the New York Times, and I was in a Boko Haram area of Nigeria a couple of years ago. There was a huge blast area where several hundred people had, uh, had been killed in a series of attacks, uh, or, si or simultaneous uh, attack. And I was struck that you still had almost universal use by then of smartphones, and people were able to keep track of, for example, millet prices. How in Guatemala, a country I'll confess I don't know, are you seeing mobile phone access now change the, uh, the way that people are doing business, and how is that allowing them to connect to world markets and to international economic opportunities? Well, Guatemala in particular has a great case study in the telecom industry. Ten years ago, they uh, opened... Uh, the, the, the telecom market for a lot of big players to come to Guatemala. This really helped uh, for the penetration of smartphones uh, to, to grow amazingly fast. So right now we have uh, double smartphones than population in Guatemala in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the challenges that we're having is, okay, I give you the smartphone, but do you know how to use it? Because more than 50% of them are just using them for calling or texting. So we're seeing this uh, amazing penetration of smartphones and how it's helping people to now uh, grow their businesses, not only within their communities, but with, uh, with the country and with other countries, especially in gig economy and, and e-commerce. Um, in Latin America, it's, it's boosting right now. I would say it's, uh, uh, it's been very beneficial, especially for, for Uber and big companies that are coming to Latin American countries. They've been tropicalizing their, and, and, and really listening to the Latin American countries to see how they can modify their platforms to really serve our countries. So just to give you an example, in, in Mexico, there has been more than 500,000 jobs created just because of Uber. More than 40% 40, 40 of them were unemployed. Uh, more than 70% were actually in an informal uh, jobs. So this is bringing a lot of jobs in, in, in developing countries in Latin America and, and, and really helping us uh, to connect with other markets in, in the world. Just last month, I was in Spain, and by coincidence, there was a national strike by taxi drivers worried about services like Uber. Have you seen protests in Guatemala uh, from people who are concerned that maybe the pace of these gig economy arrangements are undermining what might have been more stable jobs, for example, as taxi drivers? Yes, this has happened in every every country when, when, when Uber starts in. It's funny because for the first time I saw in Guatemala that the taxi drivers, they were blocking the streets. So they got, they got fined. Hmm. I, this is the first time that I see that. And uh, to be honest now, taxi drivers are starting their own apps. They're, they're starting to organize. They're starting to create even like safety uh, measurements in their apps uh, because safety is a big issue in, in, in our country. So now they're even, uh, you know, they, they actually help them to, 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 become, uh, to, to become better. And now um, I, I understand the, the, the why the, the taxi drivers are... Um, are uh, complaining, but still this is helping us to really uh, better our competition and, and for them to become more productive. So okay. Thank you. Simon, how in a much more affluent country like Bahrain, but one that has different, many different features uh, from, from Guatemala or even from our, the United States or uh, the European Union in terms of a uh, large migrant population. How is the digital economy changing that country? Well, 
for, for us as a government, we have to make sure that Bahrain's equipped to benefit from digitalization. <laughs> so we have to put in place both the hard and the soft infrastructure. Hard infrastructure, of course, is making sure we've got the subsea cables, the connectivity for Bahrain. It's also things like attracting major companies like Amazon Web Services to put their first major data center for the region in Bahrain. Uh, but to do that, we have to look at the soft infrastructure. And by the soft infrastructure, that means liberalizing the telecoms market, which was the first thing we did. Uh, but also things like making sure that the government can use the cloud, that our banks can use the cloud, putting in place laws and regulations that enable access to digitalization. All of that, as a small economy, you can do quite quickly because, because you're small. You can cherry pick and, and copy some of the regulations and laws that others have done. Uh, and put them in quite fast. But the last component to that is it's all very well for the country to benefit, but what about the average Bahraini citizen? So making sure that we have the right education system, the right programs to make sure that people have the skills so that they can enjoy benefits from that. A couple of years ago, I was hosting a New York Times panel on sustainability actually of, of data centers, for mm. example. And you do have uh, companies like Google trying mm -hmm. to, for example, provide renewable energy for data centers or putting them in places like Iceland that have both mm -hmm. a politically stable environment but also geothermal energy. Mm -hmm. What has Bahrain done in terms of sustainability? Is this natural gas that otherwise might have been flared, in which case there's not a real mm -hmm. carbon consequence? Uh, is it more gas dependent as opposed to oil dependent for the fuel system? How, how do you manage uh, uh, doing data centers which tend for which a big issue is always how do you air condition them because they need to be kept cold Absolutely. in a hot place like Bahrain. Well, the technology is advancing. So it's, it, it's, it's true now that data centers don't need quite as much energy as they did even two or three years ago. But uh, obviously we need to take advantage of the one natural resource that we have and that's the sun. And so using solar power to power up these, the, the data centers that are being built is very important uh, to, to us. We do have access to, ch to cheap gas but it's important that we use renewable energy wherever possible for these, these data centers. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, our experience is that our guests often have the best questions, and you probably have much better questions than I do. And just to be fair here, I'm gonna stop turning my back on the poor people behind me <laughs> and give them the first chance. So, do any of you have a question for one of our guests? Yes, please, uh, Ali, here you go. Hi, um, Ali from Pakistan. Um, while we've seen technologies bringing down barriers, and it's probably called the great equalizer, what we're also seeing are countries that are resource rich. Their ability to capitalize on digitalization is much higher than countries that are not resource rich. So mm -hmm. I guess the question to the panel is that while we're saying technology is the great equalizer, is it creating a different kind of discrimination where countries that are well off today will climb much higher on the digital pecking order and the countries that are lower will continue to strive um, at that lower level. Thank you. Who would like to, uh, to take that one first? Uh, Richard, I'll throw it to you. Sure, so this is basically the digital divide uh, question. And what I'd like to do is recast the question so as a way of not answering your question, is that okay? <laughs> um, that basically in a mindset where there's good industries and bad industries, some development like digital technology can put some countries in the good camp and some in the bad camp. I don't think digital technology is like that. There are a few things that will end up in uh, California because California is particularly good at that and they got a head start but those aren't necessarily the best jobs or the only jobs. What I view digital integration of the globalization is allowing emerging markets to exploit their true comparative advantage, which is quality adjusted, low cost of labor. They're excellent, ta talent, talented people who now cannot sell to the world market, who will be able to sell to the world market. Now some of the platforms may never go to Pakistan, but Pakistani uh, engineers and web developers are making a very good living selling their skills all over the world because of digital. So I don't think this is going to be a digital divide. I think it's going to lead to a convergence actually overall in income. But then I'm an optimist. So. Okay. With that, I'm going to take it around here to the other side. 
one point, standing back there in the corner, I could see our poor interpreters struggling to keep up for the simultaneous translation. And so, and I would count me in this as well, we should try to speak a little more slowly. Let's go around <laughs> over here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anushka from Sri Lanka. Um, over the last couple of days in sessions like this, as well as others around the reskilling imperative or uh, what does the FOIR mean for jobs, um, we've heard comments from most, pa most panelists, often in passing, that both the optimist and the, and the pessimist uh, in passing saying, as long as we manage the transition, things will be okay if we manage the transition, or it won't be as bad if we manage the transition. So I'd like to pose a question to maybe Richard, uh, Simon, and uh, Marisa Bell. Uh, what is the one thing that you, what would managing the transition well look like for you? What is that one thing that countries can do, or what would that look like, uh, so that we can say, yes, we managed the transition better because we did X, Y, Z. Marisa Bell? Um, so one of the challenges that I always uh, talk with my, with my colleagues and people in, in, in Guatemala, and this happens in a lot of Latin American countries, is that we're still thinking about selling bananas and coffee. Like, this has to, this has to stop. Like, why don't we sell a banana cream that is going to help you look younger in Asia, right? We really need to... to to be able to be more creative with what we're doing. And especially uh, uh, in our legal frames are still very old and they're just protecting this agricultural business. So we really need to be more innovative in that. And in Latin America in particular, what we, what we really need to keep up is with the, with the, with the payments. We're, we're still very, um, um, we, we still need a lot of work to be able to do online transactions and to accept local uh, cards. So I, I, I would say those are like two challenges that I really uh, think uh, we need to, in order to keep up with the transition. Guatemala has quite a few migrant workers in other countries. Do they still overwhelmingly have to rely on traditional, sometimes high cost money transfers or is there any yes. really online, reliable, secure method that's become popular among Guatemalan overseas residents for remittances? So for remittances in, in particular, um, Guatemala is one of the, uh, actually our GDP, I think 30% depends on remittances from the US, so it's mm. very, very high. Um, that's why I, I, I really believe that mobile technology, e-commerce, and, and gig economies can, can really help people not to, to want to move outside Guatemala and you know want to go to the US and be able to receive this uh, you know, this new opportunity, these new jobs. Uh, so going back to, to your question, there has been some platforms like uh, Zoom, for example, where people are able to receive their money in their phones, but we're still not able to do any payments. Uh, we don't have any, any, any payment solutions uh, online. So for example, I cannot use PayPal to send or receive any, any money because there's no way I can get the cash out. Has Alibaba's we, WeChat Pay moved at all into Guatemala, or you haven't seen them No, yet? it's going strong into Mexico ne next year. Amazon is going strong in Brazil, and uh, we hope uh, we start as, uh, working as a homogeneous region, especially in Central America, where countries are much smaller, so we, so we can attract other players to come. Okay, thank you. Let's get another question. Um, we had uh, here, we'll get one over here, and we'll try to alternate. This question is for both of you, and it's um, what have been the major challenges in the democratization of, um, of the cell phones and, uh, and technology in general? Because I, I've, um, I mean, it, it's easy in Bahrain uh, to, to do all these changes, but there are other countries like, for example, in Mexico, where it has been very hard to implement public policy to democratize these technologies. So I would like to know um, your experience, both of you. I mean, Bahrain has very high smartphone penetration rates, 100% uh, basically. So that's not too much of an issue. Uh, but we benefited a lot from liberalizing the telecom sector. So introducing competition, having four or five major uh, telephone companies competing, even in a small place like Bahrain, has really brought down costs and made Bahrain very competitive when it comes to, 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 to mobile phone and other telecoms uh, services. Uh, so. 
uh, not too much of a challenge for that, but, um, but maybe there's a different experience in Guatemala. In, in, in Guatemala, it's actually one of the case studies we, we use how mm -hmm. they liberalize the, the, the mobile, uh, the, the telecom industry. So we, had, we have a lot of big competitors that, that came to, to help us uh, increment the penetration of the, of the smartphones. Guatemala is one of the, of the countries in the world with the lowest cost in data and even the, the, the cell phone per se. So at least I can speak from uh, the Guatemala perspective that has been uh, that liberalizing the telecom uh, industry was one of the of the great moves uh, it, that helped us to with your, your question. We're also fortunate that we have Huawei in Bahrain as their, as their hub and, and they are rolling out 5G very, very quickly. So being small, it means that, you know, major telecoms companies can introduce technology quite quickly, providing the government's part of it has a sort of team approach to, to supporting them. Ian, I know that the uh, IHS market follows uh, telecom in particular. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what regions are you seeing that are still uh, lagging? Is it mostly a direct correlation with GDP per capita in terms of uh, smart phone deployment and so forth, or are there others, whether it's regional variables or is it heavily correlated with whether or not they've deregulated, for example, the telecom sector with multiple mobile phone providers? What, what, what kind of correlations do you see between the, the digitalization and the, uh, and the sort of other variables that might be predictive of it? All right. Well, um, in, in some ways, it's helped some countries because they were able to leapfrog landline telephony and jump straight to the cell phone. And that actually gave them some impetus where they didn't have it before. They don't have to roll out a big infrastructure in ways you did in the past. Um, that said, there are enablers. So I, I, I really feel there's sort of three tiers to this problem. There's, there's, there's the Western side where they're fully developed in economies. There's a middle tier where I think there's been a lot of work done to get those economies to where they need to be to be on a level playing field with, with the first tier. Um, and that is coming slowly. But there is a third tier, and the one we probably should focus on more, where they're somewhat disenfranchised. They, they don't have full access to the internet. They don't have mobile phone usage that is ubiquitous across the country. Um, and they don't have the ability to actually understand how to access it. And I think that's where we need to focus, because I think the middle tier economies, increasingly, they're getting it. And, and innovation from within is also working with innovation that's coming from the outside to help them develop. But I think that we don't, we've just got to be careful we don't disenfranchise a huge part of the world's population by not uh, addressing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With that, we've got a question over here, and then I'm going to come over there. Here we go. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Emmanuel. Um, this question is basically to Galpin anyway. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, banks, insurance companies um, have struggled with infrastructure development. It basically shifts the focus from their business to focusing on building um, some infrastructure that will support their business because of the introduction of technology. I think um, recently, cloud computing, um, cloud data centers, exponential technologies mm -hmm. has made um, that whole process much more easier. But then there is still issues of um, data protection, for instance. Um, in Africa, we still don't have a lot of um, local data centers. And so my question is, in, in Bahrain, you did mention something like that. Um, what are the regulations and policies? And is this something that could be taken on a global scale to include countries like Africa? Mm. It's a good question. I mean, we've just introduced a data protection law in Bahrain. It was incorporated in our, our previous sort of company law before, but now we've got a, a bespoke data protection law. Uh, and we think that's important. And it's the only country in, in the GCC that has this, this type of law. But we're not, we're not stopping there. One of the things that we think is a, is a major opportunity is hosting other countries' data. And to do that, we want to try and introduce... Uh, legislation that will allow data embassies, meaning that you know uh, a company from Saudi Arabia can put their data in a data center in Bahrain, and that data center can be subject to Saudi law rather than Bahraini law. So that's one thing that, that, that we think will help. But when we talk about financial services, really the big challenge is the fact that right across our region, there is a vast majority of people that are unbanked. So really opening up the financial services industry, allowing fintech companies to come in and compete with banks is going to be a very important component to that. 
Um, and linked to that, of course, is the E Know Your Customer reg regulation. So getting EKYC into Bahrain and actually copying what some other countries have done, whether it's Kenya, whether it's India, replicating the best of their regulations in, in somewhere like Bahrain is, could really open up the market very, very quickly. One of the things I like about this audience is that we're getting so many voices from so many different parts of the world, from Pakistan to Ghana. I encourage each of you also, as you ask your question, to mention your country, and if there's a, just a short anecdote that is the basis of your question from your experience in your country, then please do feel free to include it. Let me go over here now. We haven't had anybody over here yet. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm from Turkey. Uh, I run a um, HR tech startup. We are doing uh, training and development stuff with uh, online coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, my anecdote actually it's about that. We are uh, rewriting all of our product with AI. Mm -hmm. And my question is about uh, linguistics and uh, globalization because uh, when we started, I'm not so optimistic about the translation part because uh, we started with a lot of Turkish language data, more than 50,000 uh, lines of Turkish language data <coughs> helps us to build adaptive products, which is a technological adv advancement for our country. But when I try to implement it in English to open up to broader markets, uh, I realized that all the time that I spent to collect all the data in Turkish, there are already enough data available uh, in the world in English that I can use. And I realized some other potential competitors doing not the similar stuff, I can still compete with them, but uh, they have access to vast amount of data with their own language, within their own culture. So my question is, um, Yes, technology creates a democratization, but maybe English or you know, globally used uh, data-generated languages create another disparity uh, in terms of um, different local uh, competitive ideas. And I want to hear your take about that. So uh, I, if I could, I could do that, the, the, I think what you're getting to, and I hadn't really thought about it in my new book, is basically it's all about data. M machine translation is if you have a great big structured data set, they can fit it, and it will get very good very fast. The big advantage was when the UN released uh, millions of sentences that were hand translated among the six UN languages, and if you one of those language, languages, you're doing very well, one of which is not Turkish. So the basic problem is to get a big data set which translates Turkish into something. And until you have that, you won't have this. So what you're saying is basically it may emphasize the dominance of the largest languages because they have the big data sets and therefore the translations will be better with it. Mm -hmm. So that's a point I hadn't thought about, but you can gather this data. So for example, um, some of the smartphone companies gather data when you're doing translations and Google Translate, for example, gathers data while you're putting in translations, and they learn from it. So maybe something in, in Turkey, the go Turkish government could kind of sponsor that somehow or another to accelerate it. But it, I, I think it's an interesting point that it could lead to language dominance because of the data problem. Interesting. Ian, you looked like you were about to answer that one as well. Yeah, it, 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 it can be a problem because artificial intelligence is really just algorithms acting in a big data set. And if you've got bias in that data set, whatever type of bias, it may be gender bias, it may be language bias, you're not going to get out what you expect to get out. Yeah. And so it, it's cleaning that data set. And so in your particular example, it is that translation of that into a common language. It could be a third language. It could be a machine language. It doesn't have to be English. But you have to have some common language to create balance in that data set before it, it'll work. So I, I, I think bias in data sets is going to be a big problem for AI in the short term, but I think we'll overcome it. I'm going to go over here and take a question from one of our standing guests, but I realize there's one section of the room I have not yet taken a question from, which is you over there whom I was originally facing, so I'm going to go to you next. Think about your questions, please. You had a question back here. My name is Rashid Lahmadi. I'm from Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, and I'm ex-Telco. 
So my question in the perspective of the data protection law and the cross-border uh, data privacy laws, uh, you've been talking about embracing the data, uh, regional data center that people would uh, uh, use it to, uh, as a regional hubs. So from that perspective, what do you think are the right business models that will embrace really such model where people usually think that the data privacy is being mainly driven from security perspective, but they're for sure uh, are uh, business oriented uh, out of them as well. Thank you. Who wants to take that one first? You want to try? <laughs> Simon, you seem like a good choice. Here we go. Okay. Go. Um, I mean, the, the fact that we've got major data centers in Bahrain is good, but that's not the whole story. We want the users of those data centers to also co-locate with them. Um, then it comes down to the latency and cost, whether it's, an, whether it's a real advantage being located in really close proximity to those data centers. But that sort of, in some ways, defeats the whole purpose of the cloud. Um, but f at, a, at the very basic level, it's a great signal. The fact that a company like AWS chose Bahrain against regional competition is a big vote of confidence in Bahrain. The fact that they're developing talent in Bahrain in partnership with the universities is also very important. But now, of course, we want the content. We want the games industry. We want e-commerce from China. We want to position Bahrain on the, the digital Belt and Road initiative that China has. Uh, and we want to get a lot more jobs coming out of that initial investment. Hopefully. The challenge, though, is going to be education, making sure we've got people with the right skills that can really access those new opportunities. Okay. And now, finally, we get our section over here. Does somebody over here have a question for us? Yes, back over here. Let me uh, take the mic over. Hi, how are you? My name is Neha. I'm from India. Uh, the question I had for you was more about um, when we're talking about inclusive growth, how do we make sure that our data is not biased in the first place, which we are then feeding into to build AI on top of that, which is then resulting in artificial intelligence, which also makes our own biases and stereotypes even more magnified and difficult to change in the future. So what I mean is there were studies done previously about how the scientists that were feeding in data had a particular bias about how they viewed uh, uh, African-American or how they viewed a woman or how they viewed a particular person in a minority. And then the uh, artificial intelligence also started putting those tags on those particular minority groups. Uh, what are your suggestions and how do we deal with this problem in the future? Thank you. I'll probably take a shot at that one. And you're right. If, if you try and create a machine learning algorithm uh, to identify a cat and all you show it is pictures of black cats, uh, when shown a black cat, it will always identify it correctly. But show it a white cat, then it will never know it's a cat. Mm. Uh, and that's about the bias of the data set. So you've got to homogenize in some way the data that you put in it. You can't rely on one single source because you're going to introduce bias either from the source it's coming from or from personal bias by the person who's creating the algorithm. So the only real way to do it in a, in a way that's effective is to homogenize data set and take them from different constituencies and bring them together and create one data set. And again, in a common language is a good way to do that because then you, use, you lose the language bias that might be intrinsic in it. Ian, if, if, you, if a country has a comprehensive censorship system, does that tend to affect artificial intelligence results if you're basing it off of that data set? If you're basing it off a language data set, yes. Whatever you're doing to constrain your data set puts bias into it. And I think that wasn't really fully comprehended in the first AI models. And that's when you get situations of what you put in is giving you an output you didn't expect. And, and you take that to the extreme, even with autonomous driving now, you have that situation where you've created as many models as you can think of to make sure that's a safe environment, but you've biased it because you see it, you haven't put in the situation that arises, and then you have a problem with the auto autonomous driving AI uh, concept. So it's, it's about iteration, and it's about homogenizing data sets. OK, thank you. Two right next to each other here. Why don't I go with you first? Uh, I'm from India. Uh, my question is, uh, these digital technologies uh, have a huge impact on uh, uh, service industry and manufacturing. What about the agriculture, agriculture community? How it will improve the productivity and yield 
which will improve their lives, which are close to billion people, depending on that, and we are all also getting the help from there. Um, I, I just want to give the, the, the example of the Taoba villages in, in China and how e-commerce is you know, helping these agricultural poor, poor communities to, to, to start connecting their agricultural products to, to the world through Alibaba and through other platforms. So, so I, I, I would say now it's a, now it's a, it's, it's a time where the agricultural uh, uh, world can really start using innovation, uh, e-commerce and, and, and other platforms to, to start uh, doing the business in a different way. But, I mean, Bahrain isn't, uh, isn't, isn't very uh, user-friendly when it comes to agriculture because of our climate. But what we are seeing are a lot of hydroponic farms opening up. What you're seeing are, are companies that are delivering food in a very efficient way, so cutting down on some of the wastage that you would get for, from food spoiling. Uh, so even a country like Bahrain, which is incredibly hot, can still start to develop a, a, a fairly democratic agricultural sector. And in a more practical way, you can actually use technology to improve yields. I think that's what you're referring mm -hmm. to. I mean, you can go to different ways. So if you, if you have a large, a large farm, you can use drones. Um, they can compare um, different fertilization, different watering in different parts of it, and show where you need to water, where you fertilize. You can use the concept of the Internet of Things with microsensors. It may only cost a few cents each, but they're put throughout the land that you're trying to monitor, and they will monitor the um, nutrient content of the soil. So you can fertilize and you can optimize the use of fertilizers, not overusing them or underusing them, and making sure you maximize yield. So I think there's a huge uh, change that can happen, and it doesn't, doesn't just happen in the, in the first world. It'll happen throughout anywhere that can do that. I'd like to throw in a question here, and then I'm going to take another one over here from the side, but, and this would be for Richard. We're getting a very sunny view here from almost all the participants of digital globalization. But to use the classic example of what, what do you do with, say, a 50-year-old radiologist who still wants to work for another 15 years and faces competition to the extent that uh, the MRI images or x-rays can be emailed to a radiologist now in a country where the cost of living is extremely low and they can do it for the tenth of the price? It's hard to suggest retraining, or maybe it's a 40- or 45-year-old. Uh, these are the kinds of stable middle-class jobs that people worry about. In the United States, there are actually more certification rules now on radiologists, which are making it hard to email uh, those, those images. But uh, what, uh, let's talk a little bit, if we can, here about the dislocation, about the people who are losing their jobs as opposed to getting new opportunities. Richard, please. Sure. So in, in, deep down, this is just a form of globalization, not too different like the ones we've seen before. And globalization creates gains and pains. People get a focus on what they're good, but it leads other people to be displaced. And that's the classic problem. What do you do with the people who are displaced? And there are a few classic solutions used by governments around the world. The best examples are in Northern Europe, where governments help retrain, they help with income support, uh, whatever is necessary to help them get to a new job, but make the hiring and firing flexible. It's a, the Danish model is, 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 a, is the best one. But to, to, uh, that, that's, that's what it should be. I suspect the reaction to your question, and that which will be posed very clearly, is what I'd like to call shelterism. And I think professions in the rich countries will reach for regulation to slow down this competition from abroad. And you mentioned one, using privacy or professional regulations to slow down the competition, just as they've done with Uber. So I think we'll see a lot of that kind of shelterism where they use privacy laws, health and environment uh, uh, regulations to slow down the competition just so that they get a little shelter from the storm. So that's what I, I, I think it will be very disruptive, but uh, we will see a backlash and governments should be doing uh, more to help them transition. Okay, thank you, Richard. Why don't we take another question over here now? Thank you. Hi, I'm Parth. I'm bringing you all love from Toronto, Canada. <laughs> it's as Canadian as my opening could go. Um, my question is, going back to data sets, do you think that there should be limits on how much monopoly uh, private corporations should be allowed to create from uh, proprietary data sets? So, for example, Facebook can 
uh, Google, at this point, the volume of data that they have, uh, smaller players like us that are looking to innovate, there's no way we can compete. Uh, what are your thoughts on a um, analogous model to something like patents, where you have a 20, you know, we, we look at the public interest, say we need innovation, but at the same time, we curtail the monopoly and we say you have 20 years in the US to uh, uh, commercialize those, that innovation. As we enter this new fourth uh, industrial revolution, what are your thoughts about having a similar policy regime for, for proprietary data sets? Ian, maybe? Yeah, I, I, I take the point, although the examples you gave, for example, we, we use the, the Facebook um, API to enable us to, to, to get information from that. You can legislate. Um, I think that it will actually evolve through um, companies actually understanding the benefit of sharing data sets and having common data sets that people can access. And, and I hope that's the way it goes, and it does seem to be going that way already. Because if you make publicly or, or company-wide accessible data sets and, and, and put them in one place, everybody can use those data sets and, and perform from them. The companies themselves will, will get the advantage that they're not only relying on their own data set, they get access to, to their competitors and other data sets that might be relevant. So I think the benefits to everybody are in sharing data sets, and I think that's the way it will go. You've got to disintermediate, of course, personal information out of them and make sure it's unidentifiable, but, but I think, I hope, we'll go in the direction of data sets that are, are available to everybody. If I can add to that, I mean, I think it's important, though, that regulators do. Otherwise, you get some companies that share and others don't. So I think uh, one example would be financial services. I mean, the UK is really led in opening up the, the banking sector and the APIs for banking. We're trying to do that in Bahrain, but you can't let the banks do it. You have to actually tell them they have to do it, and, and our central bank is taking a lead in, in doing that. Because once you do that, you really open up uh, for a lot of competition from smaller fintech companies that can access and use that data. Okay. I'm going to take a question over here, but one thing I did want to mention is that this particular panel seems to have attracted an audience that's about four-fifths men, and so there are not that many questions yet from the women. So I want the question after this one to be from one of the women in the audience, please. We want to try to get everybody asking questions. Thank you very much. My name is Matar. Uh, don't translate it in Spanish, but in Arabic. Matar means rain. In Spanish, is to kill. So my, my, my question about the data, uh, data center. If you build a data center, what is your main service? Is it the co-location or the services? And when you are giving a service like SaaS or PaaS, who's responsible of cyber security? And if there is any attack, what will be the consequences? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Um, cyber security, I mean, cyber security is the responsibility of the government, of course, to, to a certain extent, but it's also the responsibility of the, the, the owners of the data, the hosts of the data. Uh, AWS, of course, have uh, major, uh, major initiatives to, to constantly improve their cyber security. We as a government are also looking continuously at, uh, at making sure that Bahrain is, uh, is safe from, from cyber attacks as best we can. So it's a, it's a very complex issue. The main services that we want to have from data centers, well, it's, it's, it's all the users of that data. So, of course, financial services and being a financial service center is, is one part of it. Uh, but we've got to allow the banks to use the cloud, to use some of these new data centers. We've had to change some of our regulations, pushing government departments not to all have their own little servers, but to use the cloud where, where appropriate is, is another uh, enabling uh, uh, initiative that we have and it's saving a lot of money for Bahrain. Um, but we want to attract new industries. Uh, gaming is very big, for example, in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So if we can attract some of China, China's and Korean uh, games producers and help them to localize the games for, for the Gulf, that could be a new niche area for Bahrain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that gaming in the sense of both of, of gambling or only no, of not gambling? Games? Definitely not gambling. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, was, if that, if that would be interesting yes. if that would be popular in Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have any women, since I promised the women in the audience a chance to ask a question here? We had one earlier from Alba over on the other side, but uh, um, if not, I will uh, go over here now. Uh, 
Uh, hi, my name is Anas. I'm from Saudi Arabia, so I understand how big is the <laughs> gaming industry, video gaming industry. So, uh, but I think it will be very challenging actually because uh, I know as well there's a lot of data centers being built in Saudi, mm -hmm. as we are speaking, mm -hmm. and I think Amazon as well is mm -hmm. negotiating with the Saudi government, like how to build it in Saudi. Uh, and it goes back to the question asked by the uh, colleagues from UAE, I mm. guess. It's like how you are going to protect the data mm. and uh, as well the connectivity as well because sometimes you will have a different connectivity uh, signals uh, within the, the Saudi. So the infrastructure is still not spread out, I guess, mm. in all over the Saudi. Um, but this is a challenge I think it's, uh, you need to consider if you yeah. are one to attract businesses. My question is, is uh, how to protect the data, actually, uh, because it's very sensitive in, in Saudi and I guess in the GCC region as well. Well, in Saudi, you legislate to protect da data. What we're saying is you can host your data. If we, if we can uh, develop this, this new legislation, this new... Uh, uh, these new laws in, in Bahrain that allow for data embassies, it means that the, the data can be protected under Saudi law, not necessarily under Bahrain law. We already have data protection legislation, which is similar to the old EU data protection legislation. Um, so that, we think, is a step in the right direction. But uh, having this concept of, uh, of data embassies is something that we think could be quite important for, for us in Bahrain. Over here now, please. Hi, I'm Christine from Malaysia. Um, I'm really interested about understanding a bit more about implementation of data embassies. I mean, there are positives, and I guess the, the delivery of it is something else as well. Mm. Data is the new all, is that what everyone says, and, and right now with oil and gas and, and what's going on around the world, uh, evolving around oil. I mean, what are the challenges then where you have certain groups uh, monopolizing data embassies in certain parts of the world? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how is that going to change the way we do things? Well, I think it's important to have competition. So we've got Amazon Web Services, but we would love to have some of the big Chinese uh, data centers that are, that are looking very aggressively at the region. I think the one country that has begun to introduce this uh, data embassy concept is Estonia. Seems to be quite working quite well there. In Bahrain, we're not afraid to copy people that have good ideas and have introduced good legislation. Uh, so we're, wa we're watching to see how that works. But for a small economy that doesn't have it, huge amounts of its own data, if you really want to be a hub, I think this is a concept that we have to start to, to, to adopt. Okay. Well, another question here. One moment. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking about something uh, pretty now. ISO policies actually pushes um, data backup to tapes to some extent. I'm just thinking if we are going to rely on cloud data centers, having um, data embassies in other countries, how are we going to control backups? And how are we going to control disaster recovery? And in countries where there are regulations that aligns with ISO, especially the 27001, mm -hmm. is, is there a way around it? Or are you going to look into the future how to work around that? Well, I guess the backup also has to be included within the data embassy. Maybe not in exactly <coughs> the same location, but under the same framework in the same country. I think that's the only way we could, we, we, could, we, could, we could do that in Bahrain. Or possibly in different countries. Or possibly different countries, as a, yeah. As a, as a very yeah. distributed backup. That's true. Simon, is there a country that is marketing itself as a place that does not back up for <laughs> privacy reasons? That mm. is, has anybody tried that as a theme just because people don't necessarily want some things backed up. Um, I mean, already there are concerns, mm. for example, that if somebody said something uh, controversial in China on the internet six years ago, that's still all recorded somewhere, and to the extent the, uh, the environment might change, they might get in trouble over that. Mm. Uh, there are, uh, where, is there anybody who has tried to market that? I haven't heard of that. But I haven't heard of it. Maybe no. somebody else has. Like the Swiss banking of data or yeah. something like yeah. that. So. Yeah. 
I mean, <laughs> why don't we go over here? <laughs> you, you, yes. you could encrypt. I mean, that's the way that people typically, you back up encrypted data that you've encrypted yourself. Whoever's uh, backing up your data does not get access to the encryption code. So yeah. it's kept to you. Encryption. Interesting. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Faisal. I'm from Saudi Arabia. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, digital transformation and rapid, especially when uh, it's away from the eyes of the government and regulations. But we're seeing very few transformation when it comes to the physical world, agriculture, industrial revolution. It's, it's a bit slow. So, uh, so from your point of view, do you think uh, WIF could play a, a role as a platform to push governments towards legislation and regulations that uh, at least accelerate this change? Or play, uh, play it, uh, I come from an entrepreneurial community, or, or, or play it entrepreneurial, away from the government eyes, so the government will be pushed later on uh, to do more legislation. Um, I, I just, um, I want to start with answering your question. In, um, in, in some countries, in Africa and then in America, the good thing is that the regulations have not been created, so the technology is actually going faster which I think is an advantage for our regions. Uh, we have a regulation in Guatemala in particular that is stopping us from connecting ourselves to e-commerce. And it's the legal, uh, the online signature. We're not able to legalize any document or, or to have a online signature. So that's stopping us to make any transactions, accept any contract online. Uh, which, of course, we need the government to support us in order to be able to open you know, the country to, to all these platforms in e-commerce. So that just, is just an example of you know, what a government can help, can help out. And in other ways, that, it's, that technology is actually going faster than the regulations. And in and WEF specifically, it's, it's, it's actually happening. Um, I participated in a couple of workshops in the last two days, one on AI, one on blockchain, uh, and WEF is taking a very active uh, role in bringing what it does so well, bringing together both the commercial communities, governments, um, academia into one conversation to try, and, to try and advise before all of those regulations get put in place, to try and create one that is more global. So yes, it's very actively happening right now. Coming back on that last question, actually, I noticed your mention of encryption. How, why, how many countries restrict encryption? I mean, what I was thinking of was somebody in Western China who was quoting from the Quran six years ago may now wish that was encrypted. But encryption is not available in China domestically. Is there a growing proportion of the world that does not allow encryption, or is that proportion shrinking? I, I, I don't know. I, I imagine it's probably staying about the same countries that have been more open continue to be more open. Um, you still can't get a code to unlock an Apple um, phone, for example, in the US. Um, and those countries that have tended to be more restrictive have stayed more restrictive. I haven't seen any dramatic shift either way. Okay. Okay, we've only got time for a couple more questions, and whom do we have? Here we go on the side that I've been neglecting. Let's get a question here. Uh, hello, Robert Hodgkinson from the Institute of Chartered Accountants in London. I think... Um, Underneath a lot of the uh, later questions, there's been um, challenges to um, institutions. I just wonder if we're going to get uh, global digitalization right, do we need to be building some new institutions that, uh, that look after a world order? And isn't that particularly difficult at a time when actually the established institutions that we've got at a global level are under real threat? How do you, how do you see that? Is, uh, WEF's okay, but it's not, a, it's not a global institution that actually establishes common rules mm -hmm. and uh, polices things. So is there, a, is there a need for institution building, or shall we wait for it all to go wrong <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then have a crisis, which probably you know, is the birthplace of IMF and United Nations? Well, if, if I can answer that, we'll probably have to wait for the crisis, but there's definitely a need for more regulation. Mm -hmm. So first of all, it's astounding there's no AI governance. Mm. There's no treaty mm. on AI or whatever, mm. so that's amazing. And the, but the other, just, to, just to, to touch directly on digital globalization of services, taxation will be an enormous issue. So for example, I, I run a website in London and we have some copy editors in Bangkok and 
the tax, as far as I know, is not paid anywhere. I'm trusting the freelancers paying taxes locally, but that's me trusting. Now, if 10% of the workforce goes online, how are you going to tax that? Where should it be taxed? Those will require uh, treaties and, and, and agreements, uh, very much like the problem we had with where do you tax multinational profits. This will be with services. And I think it could easily be a very, very large problem very, very fast. So that's at least one type of governance that we should need. Another is labor standards, for example. Most trade treaties now have minimum labor standards about rights to unionize and that sort of thing. And this international freelancing is completely the Wild West. There's no governance whatsoever. And I'm quite sure that, as we saw with the sort of backlash against uh, sweatshop labor in, in clothing sold in the West, we'll find the same thing about freelancers. And so there will become a, a need to certify that the freelancers are actually being treated to, with a, a minimum degree of, uh, hum, of you know, labor rights. So th that's, those are two that I really think we do need. With that, actually, we're out of time. I apologize for that. But I did want to say to everybody, thank you so much for coming. This has been, even I think by World Economic Forum standards, an uncommonly geographically varied audience. <laughs> and it's been great. It's been great to have questions, whether it's from Dubai, India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and so many other places, Ghana. So thank you all very much for coming. I think we have a lot here to think about in terms of both how specific sectors can be changed through digital globalization. We've had mentions of financial services uh, in Guatemala and elsewhere. Uh, we've had not just mentions of, of, of sectors, but also of how individuals affect are affected, such as whether it's taxi drivers, whether it's freelancers. So with that, we have a lot to think about. I encourage you all, if you want to stay afterwards for a few minutes, uh, introduce yourself to some of your neighbors, please do. And thank you all for coming to Tianjin. Thank you. Thank you.